All right. You knew it was coming. You could probably hardly contain yourself. This is brain part two, you know, following after brain part one. And so in this one, we're going to deal more with the rest of the brain, not the cerebrum. And we're going to first talk about this area called the diencephalon. So the diencephalon on this picture is like the purpley area there. You got the purple, you got the less purple area, and you got this little area here. And so this is what we would think of as the diencephalon. And this involves three pieces, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, so under the thalamus, and the epithalamus um, on the thalamus. It's kind of what that means. I'm gonna we're gonna talk about the function for two of these, the hypothalamus and the thalamus. And you can see those things here too. You got the thalamus, you got the hypothalamus back in there. So I'm just gonna go back to this picture because you can see them better. All right, so the thalamus, its main function is to act as a relay station for information coming into this area of the brain. And so it is uh, receiving information from the outside brain and bringing it into, basically into the hypothalamus. Thalamus overall, it acts to kind of sort out all these things that you're going through. So if you can imagine um, receiving all this information, the thalamus is sorting it so that you can know how to respond or whether or not you should respond. It kind of arouses your memory, arouses things you've already learned. And so you kind of get the idea on this one. All right. The hypothalamus is the main control center for homeostasis. All right. <clears throat> Pretty much the entire autonomic nervous system is run through this section of the brain. Uh, I'll just name some examples of things that the, this is controlling to give you an idea. Things like blood pressure, uh, the, your heartbeat, uh, your digestive tract, its movements, your pupil size. You know, like when you look at a bright light and your pupils get smaller, your hypothalamus does that. Body temperature, uh, hunger, thirst, sleeping, waking, uh, all endocrine functions, all of that sort of thing are all run through the hypothalamus. It's a very important part of the brain. Also, it initiates physical responses to emotions, uh, things like crying, um, shouting when you're angry, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, this is part of the limbic system, which we'll talk about the limbic system in another video. And so it can perceive things that are more abstract, things like fear, pleasure, rage, or just our normal, natural kind of rhythms. All right. And so the, the epithalamus, we're not going to get into as much, so we'll leave that alone. And next, we're going to talk about the brainstem. The brainstem has three main areas there, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Um, very similar structure to the spinal cord, but it contains a lot of these areas that are known as nuclei, which are kind of these concentrated areas of neurons. And... Um, and these nuclei are kind of embedded in the white matter of the brainstem. Again, controls a lot of the autonomic function necessary for survival. You have the midbrain, and it plays a role in pain suppression, fight or flight response. Um, so it, it takes in things that you're hearing and seeing, so visual and auditory relay centers. And, it, you know, like if you see a pack of wild dogs running at you, your brainstem is going to help you know that that's dangerous. You don't have to have experience with wild dogs um, for you to know that that is dangerous, if, if that makes any sense at all, what I just said. Um, we sense danger before we even know or even have experience with things because of, well, because of our past, because of our evolutionary heritage, we have this. All right. The pawns. This is the pons is the origin of all cranial nerves. And so the cranial nerves are just nerves that come out of your head and go into the rest of the body and into the spinal cord. 
and these help to maintain normal rhythms like breathing, uh, which is important for the, the pons. And then there's the mandula oblongata. It c contains an area called the choroid plexus, which you see here, choroid plexus. And the choroid plexus is a membrane that forms the cerebrospinal fluid. This is where that comes from. And the medulla oblongata is, uh, controls a lot of your autonomic reflexes. And so like sneezing is a great example of an autonomic reflex. Coughing, you know, like when you feel that little tip tickle in your throat and you have to cough, you can kind of fight it back. Sometimes, you know, like now when you're in a store and you have your mask on and you don't want to cough because you don't want people to think you're sick, so you, you hold it back and you can fight it for only so long and then you just can't. You have to cough, you know, and sneezing is the same way. Uh, but even something like throwing up, even those are autonomic functions as well and they are reflex type things and the dual album gotta controls this. Then there's the cerebellum. The cerebellum is at the base of your brain. So if you like put the put your hand on the back of your neck and move it up, that's where your cerebellum is. This is 11% of your brain mass. Its big thing is it processes input from the brain stem, from the cerebral cortex, and from the sensory perception. And so it takes in all of this stuff that you know. And it coordinates movements for the skeletal muscles. And so it plays a very important role in balance. So, so let's think about this for a little bit. You have the this organ called the cerebellum. And it takes in all this information all right, from the outside world. If you're running and you see a little ditch that's two feet across, should be no problem for you to jump over. Well, how do you know? How do you know? Well, you've probably done it before, all right? You know about how fast you have to run, about how hard you have to jump. All of these things your cerebellum is basically doing the math for. And it puts together all of these experiences, your sensory input, everything that you know, and does it. This is so, things like, you know, muscle memory and that sort of thing, this is where a lot of that is coming from. Um, it kind of, you know, it... You basically, your body forms a blueprint of these kinds of movements and you get better. That's why you can get better at practiced movements and you don't, aren't good at things that you have never done. You know, some of you guys can dribble a basketball really well. I cannot. Um, there's just no way, but there are certain things that I can do that I've practiced. And so that, you know, we, we get used to this. You just think of even like typing. Uh, this is uh, our cerebellum is is running us through that. It doesn't matter which keyboard you get on. It could be a small one, big one. You kind of understand the constraints that you have to get in and you understand you remember how to type. And so that's what that is doing. There's a lot of new evidence that suggests that the cerebellum is also doing some cognitive functioning um, roles and thinking and a language and emotions. And so it does it in much the same way as it does the motor function. Uh, it compares actual output of these higher functions with the expected output. So if you think about that way, it kind of, it's doing the math and then it adjusts accordingly. So I think that's a pretty interesting way that your brain is constantly adapting and learning. And so the cerebellum, a very important part of that.